my name is Tathagat Verma. You can call me TV. It's much more handy. Or you can. Uh, uh, this is my Twitter handle. Uh, anyone knows this picture? Uh, what, what what is this? Anyone knows what what these two a box and a circle? What do they mean? Sorry. Nobody. It's piece is turned it's upside. Exactly happening like it looks. I mean, my brain <laughs> is saying that it's a. Okay, yeah. so I'll just give you ten seconds, kind of etch it in your memory because this is what we are going to learn in today's session. What is this all about, right? And uh, it's actually uh, a tool that I'll I'll share today, uh, and we'll do a slight uh, like a mini workshop kind of a thing here. But before I get started, I have a question to all of you. Can you name a few products that you absolutely love? You love them so much that you cannot live without them, or you you swear by them. You are a part of their fan following. Anything that you simply love, those products. Slack, Slack is one product. Okay, we'll we'll talk about why you do that. I just give me three or four names so that we can uh, kind of uh, deep dive into that. Come again. OmniFocus. So many of us may not have heard of OmniFocus. If you can just uh, okay, great. So I'll look up to you for help. Uh, and your name is Jim. So I'll look up to your help for that in terms of why you love OmniFocus, right? Anything else? Jira. Okay, great. I think a lot of techies, no consumer, no love for consumer products here. <laughs> Uh, what WhatsApp? Okay, great. WhatsApp. Uh, you have Square. Square. Okay. Everyone knows Square, right? We, you can make it as a point of sale terminal. Okay. These are the five products we saw here. Uh, Quicker. Twitter. Twitter. Okay. Twitter. Okay. Now I have a question for you. Uh, if I were to ask you, why do you love these products? Can you can you go a little uh, next level into that and tell me why do you love these products? And we'll focus to only these six products that we have to, uh, to, uh, talked about. For me, Twitter is basically a white site. So not only because I follow, I get to know the business and the market, but like I get white sites clicking to the cover for a lot of stuff. Okay. So I get like a quick fix. Like, so by by offering by offering something in a bite-sized uh, format, how does it help you? Uh, quick, right? Okay. Okay, so I want to just uh, nail down on the last uh, phrase that you said. It doesn't waste my time. You can theoretically get the same information. You can you can scrape the web, but then you would spend probably hours just to get to that point. And here you can save the time. So it saves the time, right? Okay, so that's the thing. Just keep that in the mind. Uh, you had a product from here, which was a Jira. Okay, why do you like Jira? Customizable, and how does being able to customize help you really? Okay. Okay. So if you were theoretically, if I have to flip the question around, if you were not using Jira and if you were using something else, uh, it would not probably give you the same level of customization or it will impose a, a different way of thinking on you and not meet your requirements. Right? So you would. And you have you want to do something, but then Jira or other tool may not allow you to do that. So whatever pain is there in terms of solving the problem is still going to be there. But Jira comes and takes away that pain from the whole process. Totally okay. I have not put words in your mouth. I'm just trying to put them in a certain way. Thank you, thank you. Uh, OmniFocus. Can you tell me why do you like OmniFocus? That, that specific help from the tool, hassle-free. Okay, so it takes the pain away from that. It takes probably the guesswork. It takes away uh, the the unnecessary steps. Probably it just gets the job done, right? Uh, okay, so that, let let's just keep it here for now. Um, Square. What, what is it that you like about Square? Okay. Okay. 
So that's you're talking about from a merchant point of view, I'm assuming. From okay. 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 So ease of use and standard no nonsense kind of a do it yourself configuration. Yeah. Probably, yeah. So so low price point, low entry barriers makes the job easier. It's free now, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, you had a product from here as well, right? Slack. Okay. Why do you like Slack? I, I know in the morning we actually had a lot of discussion around Slack, right? So, but then anything else that you would like to call out here? Okay. Right. Correct. So it's being able to be stay in touch. Yeah, you, you, you. Yeah. Otherwise, if you are in the sh in the in the shopping mall and somebody says, "Hey, that that deliverable was due," and it's like, "Hey, I'll go get home and get it for you." Yeah. Okay. 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 I'm sure there will be a group of people who probably don't like Slack for the exactly same reason, right? <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Uh, was there any other product that we left out? There was one more. WhatsApp. Right. Yes. Yeah. Correct. I know a lot of project teams who don't like using Slack, but they use uh, WhatsApp for project communication, right? They actually track the entire project on that. But anyway, that's personal preference. So that's good. Thanks for that. Bear with me for another few minutes. Can you tell me three or four products that are absolutely, absolutely lousy products? You hate them. If you meet the creator of the product on the road, you want to kill them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, okay. That, that was that was uh, that was some statement, right? Okay, so we'll come to that in a moment. Why do you hate Jira so much? But anyone else wants to say any other name of product that they absolutely hate? Visual Studio. Okay. PowerPoint. Okay. Okay. So let's come back to these three for a moment. Let's start with the Jira gang here. So if, if uh, potentially if potentially United Artists were to remake Modern Times, Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times, and those of you who have watched it, they know it how Charlie undergoes a nervous breakdown uh, doing the stuff on the S conveyor belt. Probably there will be an equivalent of Jira in the Modern Times, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like handling tickets throughout the oh, night I and do, yeah. okay. So you feel that it is actually turning people into a mechanical bots, and they are all they are doing is just responding to that, and, and they are driven by the SLAs. Okay, and you feel that it, it basically the purpose for it has, it has been created is not really uh, something else, but it's turning users into something else. Fair point. You you I mean you have a point of view. We are not uh, okay. Second one, Microsoft uh, Visual Studio, or if it was the OS, or or you you we have like taken a broad brush for the whole Microsoft <laughs> or something. Let's let's be kind to everybody, right? <laughs> oh. So why it's, you're talking about the OS? Is it for Vista or is it for 10? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm sure there are people like it. Anything specific that you can help us with, uh, which say, hey, this is really the thing that actually uh, pains me or takes. Okay. Okay. Well, the governments of the world are known to do the same thing to people. So. Fair enough. Point taken. Okay. Third point. You had PowerPoint there. What is it about PowerPoint that you hate? Okay. Okay. 
Awesome. Okay. Fair enough. The, I mean, we have Prezi. I, I personally use Haiku Deck. Anyone Haiku Deck lover here? Haiku Deck is an amazing MVP of PowerPoint. It has only three features. But 90% of the time, I need only three features of PowerPoint and I use only Haiku Deck. H A I K U Deck D E C K. Haiku as in Japanese word Haiku. Haiku Deck.com. I'm not here. They haven't paid me for that, but that was it. <laughs> okay. So thanks for that. I just keep that in mind because as we go into this, it will be helpful to kind of have some of these things that we talked about of what is it that you are liking about some of the products and what is it that you are not liking about some of the products, right? The fact that you have a choice to your uh, opinion is sacrosanct. We are not going to debate that. We just want to understand how can we use some of those ideas in building better products here. So uh, officially the talk, uh, the title of the talk is creating awesome value proposition using value proposition canvas. And uh, this is actually what is known as the value proposition canvas. And I'll, I'll explain you what this is all about. Uh, so, so this is what we are going to uh, spend next 30 minutes talking today. And we'll have a Q&A. Uh, you can jump in in between. It, it's a small group, so feel free to jump in and, and ask me. So Alexander Osterwalder is a guy who created, he, he wrote this book basically in, in 2010, The Business Model Generation. Uh, is, is it familiar to a lot of people here? Okay, I see four or five hands going up. So if you are, if you haven't read this book, I would strongly recommend it. I think it's one of the best books written in the last five years. However, I'm going to use Alexander's second book in my discussion today, and I'll talk about that as well. I have just taken it for a just for the context, a few uh, things from there. So what Alexander Osterwalder talked about was the fact that when we look at any business model, the first thing we actually try and do is look at the environment map here. So we try to see what kind of an environment we are really operating in. There are market forces that, uh, that impact us. There are key trends, uh, and they could be technology, social, societal, and so on. Then there could be industry forces, and finally, the macroeconomic forces here. Now, this is really the big picture kind of a thing, right? I mean, this is not something that you would go into your weekly or monthly uh, reviews, but this is something which is a very strategic level kind of a input there. So this is the first thing that he talked about. The more interesting thing was something that he talked about in the context of business models. And the business model he defines as that they describe the rationale of how an organization creates, delivers, and captures value. Now, if you are not familiar with this context there, I'm sure most of us understand the notion of creating and delivering value. A lot of times, most of us really don't understand the context of capturing value. So I'll just give you a small example because if we have more time, I can talk more about that. Take the case of Uber. Now Uber uses every single free APIs that are available to it, whether it is the geo, uh, the Google APIs for actually lo looking up the distance and so on. But it doesn't pay anything to Google. It doesn't pay anything to Comcast. It doesn't pay anything to Airtel. It doesn't have to pay anything. It actually uh, Uber is so. So look at it the other way around. Comcast has laid the copper fiber. Google has made the APIs and has done the mapping of all the GIS information. A lot of these guys have created the value. They have delivered the value, but somebody else is capturing that value. Uber in this case. And Uber has a $50 billion, a $60 billion valuation for something that it doesn't make, it doesn't uh, own. Uh, it, it just sits on the top of the tech stack and makes money out of it. So capturing the value is one of the most recent uh, conversations that we are having. Uh, take the case of airlines. Airline, in, anyone knows the size of airline industry globally? $750 billion. And how much is the profitability as a percentage in that sector? Three, two to 3%. Now imagine no industry in the world has that level of money flowing in $750 billion all for 2 or 3% of profitability. And then you see all these fancy shop stores and everybody really trying to make money out of it and pay nothing to these air, uh, airports or aircraft. And that is why you see all the low frail airlines. I mean, if you travel in India, in Indigo, you would see, uh, like I remember 10 year, 15 years back, somebody actually, when he told that fact to me, I, it opened my eyes. How many of you go to and watch movies? A lot of us go to multiplex and watch the movies. What's the average movie ticket price? 250, 300, depends on the season, right? How much, come again? 
depends on the city as well. In Karnataka, they are actually working to reduce it to 120 rupees now. They are they're already done. How much money do you spend on the popcorn and the soda? They make more money. Right. They make more money out of the popcorn and the soda than they actually do it on the ticket sales. Right. So PVR, if you look at their balance sheet, a good 60% of their revenues were coming from popcorn and soda and not from the movie ticket. Movie ticket is subsidiary. They might, they can actually stop selling movie tickets for all you know, because they are making more money. So that's the, absolutely. And caramel, my favorite is caramel. You never get caramel anywhere in the world. You only get it inside the movie theater. And I watch movies only because I have to eat caramel popcorn there. Right? You are not alone. A lot of people do that. Thank you, sir. Okay. So this is all about, so I think capturing value is more important. Now what Alexander Osterwalder did was, he basically said, any business in the world, whether you take a GE or a Walmart to the two people startup that's coming up uh, in your basement garage, everything has these nine building blocks, starting with the customer segments, value proposition, channels, customer relationships, revenue stream, key resources, key activities, partnerships, and cost structure. And you can actually, so any company in the world, any size, any kind of a thing, you can actually put them in these, you can map their business model in these nine building blocks. Now that's not news to us, we all know that. Uh, but what he did was something very remarkable that he actually created in a graphic manner. Uh, uh, but he put them all together into a what he calls as the business model canvas. And this canvas was actually a very revolutionary thing because it created a shared visual language of communicating the building blocks of a business. And they have a purpose here because what you see on the right side is the value that the customer sees. These are all the things that happen in the in front of your show, in front of your uh, shop, basically. And these are all the back office things that happen on the left, on, on the back side of it, the partnership, the activities, and the heavy lifting that you do in, in, in order to deliver the uh, the value to the customers. So this is how basically he created that. And how do we use that? So, so now I have a question to you. Suppose all of you are entrepreneurs and you are starting your new business. How do you think your business model canvas, which is supposed to look like this, how will it look like on day one? Yes, so white page, yes. I mean, you will say, hey, what do I do? Who are our customers? How do we market? All that kind of stuff. It's a, it's a blank slate. Because honestly, we don't know who are our customers. We don't know what is the value proposition. We don't know any of these answers here, right? So what do we do? What are you going to do with that? Because you obviously cannot start on a blank slate. So how do you proceed with that? Well, what we do is, we do a bunch of guesswork. But the problem is, if you told anyone that you are guessing, they will, you'll get fired. So we take a little more sophisticated language and we say, we are doing hypothesis. <laughs> right? Because hypothesis, <laughs> right? Because hypothesis is a much, uh, much cooler term for that. But end of the day, we are all doing the guesswork. Anyway, we, <laughs> right, right? So, uh, uh, so so that's what we do because we have to get started. So we obviously have to make a meaningful. Now, even though you have put some hypothesis on that, here is my, my guru who basically I like, I mean, I love whatever Steve Blank says. This is what he said. There are no facts inside the building. So he said, get out of the building. I think this is the most important words ever written in a management book. Because what happens is we typically, in our, uh, in our earnest and zeal to solve a problem, we make decisions on behalf of people whom we don't understand. So we say, yeah, I think we should do it this way. No, no, I think that's how people would do it. You are not the target customer. You, the product is not being designed for you. How do you understand it? So, so now if you have to convert this guess into something uh, meaningful, the only way for you to do that is something known as a customer contact. We have to go and talk to the customers. We have to go and talk to the real people in the world and do that stuff. And then as Ash Moria would, ex would uh, tell you, you basically systematically test your model. So you start with a bunch of business models here. Some of them are an obvious no starter. Some of them start there and you validate it and it goes for a toss. But, at some, but one of those business models keep changing and you keep iterating on them till the time all the boxes are green, which means all the hypotheses have been validated based on real world data and they are good to go. And what does it mean? You have found, here you don't know how to make money because you don't know who are the customers, what is the cost structure, what is the revenue stream. By the time you come to this point, you have figured out a repeatable and sustainable way to make money. 
your fa your father in law does not have to call anybody's brother in law to get a business that is basically a sustainable and scalable business model you have learned how to make money when people come and buy your product you are not shocked and surprised hey why why somebody is buying my product right because you know who are those customers you have discovered them and you know why they are buying your products here that is the nirvana that is basically what we want to do here that is the 101 of business model canvas right now we start our discussion after that in this session how do you create the value proposition you know the target customers you know what is the value proposition the challenge is how do you create a value proposition we we looked at some of the products that you you spoke about and you said some of those things were awesome and also some of the bad products there why is it that these were companies were not able to create the right value proposition we'll try to understand that so in 2014 alexander osterwalder wrote another book a beautiful book amazingly lovely graphics there uh, value proposition design in which he actually took the whole theory to the next level and he explained how we build the right kind of a value proposition here so i am going to refer to that sorry the some of the pictures are not coming but they will be on slide share so you can have a look at that so what he did was he said hey basically we talked about environment map as the first thing then we went to the business model canvas and now we are actually blowing up the business model canvas so if if you if you see here what they have done is these two these two columns here if you go back these two columns we are talking about the value proposition and the customers what this guy has done is he has basically zoomed into that and he has blown them out and said this is what is the value proposition canvas so these were the early the graphics that i showed in the slide number 1 right and we'll understand what each of these boxes mean here so let's start with the first one the customer profile the 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 peace circle inverted is the customer profile which basically helps us clarify customer understanding and all we are doing is the theme of this is observe because we don't want to second guess on behalf of our customers we don't know enough of, uh, about our customers so we are going to learn about it by observing them right and we'll understand each of these boxes here the value map is the other uh, square on the uh, on the left side which is basically creating value for your customer which is how we design based on how we have understood about the customers so the blue circle is what the customers are and the and the yellow box is how we are going to design it for the customers right and so let's look at each of these things now the circle itself has three of these uh, uh, quadrants customer jobs gains and pains let's look at each one of them customer jobs they describe the things that your customers are trying to get done in their work or in their life a customer job could be the task that they are trying to perform and complete the problems that they are trying to solve or the needs they are trying to satisfy now let's look at the uh, some of the products that you guys talked about are you able to see that there are uh, there the, the, you are able to map the customer jobs to jira or to the microsoft office or to square that we talked about like what does square do it allows you to actually make anything any phone with a 3.5 mm jack as a point of sale terminal so that you can swipe your card and make it as a payment gateway right a slack would be something which is a collaboration platform which makes it possible for the entire team to come on the same page literally uh, and irrespective of where you are in what time zone you are you are able to access and be with the team there right uh, a jira for those who are jira lovers would be actually that it allows you to be in control of how you want your project information to be managed tracked and reported and communicated and so on and so forth right come again okay so those are the customer jobs there right now the types of job could be functional social jobs also could be there right anyone knows what's a social job okay so it's hardly the social work literally it's more like i want to buy that latest uh, smartphone so that i look cool in front of the uh, people that i hang out with right so that is the social job here it has a it has a social slash emotional kind of an appeal to basically uplift your image in the group that you hang out with it could be personal jobs or supporting jobs so there can be n number of things that alexander osterwalder describes in the book there now let's look at the pain here right that's the second box here the pains describe anything that annoys your customers before during or after trying to get a job done or simply prevents them from getting a job done pains also describe the risk that is potential bad outcomes and so on and so forth there now the risk itself can be extreme or moderate similar to how the jobs can be important or insignificant there 
and the type of pains could be undesired outcomes, problems, characteristics, obstacles, risks and so on. So let us go one by one again at some of those products that you talked about. Uh, are there any pains that WhatsApp uh, solves for you? Correct. And then it, it cost money every time to send it and there was no group SMS unless you bought a group SMS software or something in which case it was promptly declared as a spam. So you had all kind of problems in keeping track of the mail threads. So these were all the pain points there, right, uh, which it was solving there. Uh, from the OmniFocus point of view, any pains you would like to basically say that you had before uh, you started kind of using it? Right. Paper and pen, very difficult to do, but now you have a way in which you can uh, kind of put them all on the same page. Probably you can even do, I am not familiar, but maybe it allows you to do some kind of a projection or what if analysis or a compare and so on and so forth. Fair enough, yeah. So those were those would be some of the pain points that uh, probably might uh, come there, right? Let us look at the gains. That is the third quadrant in the customer side of the equation. What are the gains? The gains describe outcomes and benefits your customers want. Some gains are required, expected or desired by customers and some would surprise them. Right, they include functional utility, expected gains, required gains, desired gains, and so on. So let's engage with the with the participants from here. Any pay, any gains can you think of from when we, we talked about some of the products earlier when people were settling down? Uh, but any gains you you want to add about any product that that you love? That hey, this is the gain that it gives me. We talked about earlier. I think we had a thing that we, uh, Jira. We had some somebody saying that hey, I'm able to sort it out, and hence I'm able to save a lot of time. The fact that I am able to save time is a pain, uh, I am sorry, it is a gain because I am I'm gaining all the time here, right? Anything else anyone would like to? Right. That is a gain there because it allows you to share the document without worrying about hey, which version of document you have and is everyone having the same version at the same time or not? Correct. So it's a real-time collaboration uh, that that's available, right? So that could be a gain that. Uh, that's a good question. We'll come to that in a moment. You are already five slides ahead of me, so. Okay. So then, what do you do now? You have worked together as a team, and the whole idea of them is work together as a team with bunch of post-its and do that thing. And then what we do is we rank them all together. So we basically put them all together and say, hey, these were. The job importance, the severity, the, the, the relevance and we are just putting it all together here kind of a thing from important to un insignificant and so on. So this is the first part of it. We have done some analysis, some observation, we understand about customer pain points, what, what do the customer expect to gain out of that, what are the jobs that they are looking to get done. I mean when you buy, in, uh, when you buy a, a, a cappuccino, you are not expecting that cappuccino to, to give you a status report. The jobs to be done with a cappuccino is that you expect to get uh, some energy first thing in the morning so that when you reach office, people don't say that you have party till 4 in the morning, right, or something like that. You, you do want to look fresh in front of the people. Now let's look at the design part of it. We have tried to understand it from the customers, what are the pain points, how are things with them. Now let's look at some of the gain, uh, some of the design, how we do that. So again, there are three boxes, products and services, gain creators, and pain relievers. As you will see, this is basically mirroring actually. So it is mirroring the pain that we saw on the customer side of it with the pain relievers and the gain it is mirroring with the gain creators here. And let's just uh, uh, deep dive into that. So products and services, we all understand uh, basically a list of what you offer. Think of it as all the items your customers can see in the shop window, metaphorically speaking. So if you were to potentially put up a shop window, anything that you will put up uh, in, the, in the glass pane is your products and services, right? These could be physical, tangible, these could be intangible, digital, financial, there could be n number of ways of basically slicing and dicing the, uh, the products and services. What about the pain relievers? Now pain relievers describe how exactly your products and services alleviate specific customer pains. So if your customer pain is, hey, I am getting this information from seven different sources and I have a problem with the format every time, I don't know how to keep track of it. Well, that's a specific pain reliever of taking care of it and getting it. 
in case of slack for example your problem might be hey people are all having updates at the different time there is no centralized repository uh, i have been i am used to doing ms project there which is a one way street it only it only dictates people what to do but it has no scope for really bringing it back and that information is in a word document or in an excel sheet or somewhere i can have it all together and slack i think last week they also introduced a, a group chat or a group phone actually so everyone can even have a conference call uh, all so a bunch of things that it's basically taking away the pain that people have, might have recognized in a group collaboration platform uh, like slack kind of a thing that they might be expecting those features right so that's that's a kind of pain reliever third category gain creators so gain creators are describing how your products and services create customer gains right now we talked about some of the gains what like i might be saving now what kind of gains do we have it could be saving time it could be saving money that by doing it i am actually able to save 2 hours of my time every day for example if i can pay my electricity bills online it saves me 2 hours of hassle every time otherwise i'll have to go out in the traffic stand there in the queue and make it happen right if i use a, a microsoft uh, powerpoint it actually saves a lot of effort for me in terms of putting a presentation together uh, and 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 so on and so forth right so these are basically the gain creators which can allow you to Uh, do that now. The question that you had, uh, uh, Shini, pain relievers versus gain creators. So the whole idea is that yes, they might appear to be very similar, and we are not saying it can. There can even be an overlap at times. The only reason Alexander Osterwalder in his book decided to keep it two separate was just to explicitly nudge people and say, "Have you thought of pains? Have you thought of gains?" Just so that you don't miss out something there. in in practice we might see a lot of overlap as well we we don't uh, deny that so that's the whole point here but there are some differences here as well in terms of pain relievers and gain creators as well uh, i've written it i i can share it i'll share this little later again you rank them all together the idea is to again once again do that and then you start looking at it and then you start looking at hey how can we create a fit between these two so we know we know what is it that people want to do with microsoft powerpoint or a slack or a whatsapp or a twitter we know what are the pain points that they have today uh, people are saying hey i don't i i don't like twitter because uh, twitter doesn't allow me to send a tweet with 10000 characters or the gains could be that hey twitter allows me to send pictures and 10 second wine videos and all that stuff there so these are the gains that i can do because i can send the video or i might be and and then i start looking at it and saying hey i know that this is the pain here how am i going to relieve this pain here can i do something about relieving that specific pain so you start kind of mapping these things so you are subconsciously aware of the 20 different pains and then you are saying okay i think i have relieved about 15 of the pain points here i know that i cannot relieve all the pain points here but i have understood the most critical pain points and now, now i am in a position i think it looks good for now so this is basically how we do and that's when we start talking about the fit because unless these are really fitting with each other the magic doesn't happen right you cannot have these two as two different incoherent pieces of information one is going in its own plane one second is in its own plane right so that's where we want to look at the whole notion of fit what is fit you achieve fit when customers get excited about the value proposition which happens when you address important jobs alleviate extreme pains and create essential gains that customers care about if this fit doesn't happen normally the other type of fit happens right because as as customers and consumers of something we start saying who can be, i mean wh what were they thinking when they built that product right that kind of stuff so we want to avoid that fit and get the, get to this fit so in the in the book basically they have explained about it and the, and the whole fit happens in th on three level the first one we talk about is the problem solution fit fit which happens on paper what does it mean when you go and map this information here you have a bunch of post its and a bunch of information and you say hey am i able to see can i relate some pain reliever to the pain that it is here or at least some some kind of a mapping where i have basically take care of taken care of the pains and the gains they may not be a one is to one mapping all the time but more important is have we adequately address the most critical pain points that the customers are facing right so that is on paper that we have done which is what we call as the psl or the problem solution fit we go to the next level when we build something out of it because obviously something on paper is useless unless we can put something in uh, in in a tangible form and put it in front of the customers in which case we go out to the market with an mvp or a prototype or a proof of concept or whatever is there that helps you validate 
okay, this is what customers are suffering and this is what will alleviate some of their pain points here. So that is what we call as the product market fit because that's the time when we can actually start seeing that a real working prototype or a software actually addresses some of the customer pain points. And finally, we have the third level of uh, validation or the fit when we say when the money starts ringing in and when you, are, uh, when you are getting it in the bank, which is the business model fit, which means now that you have built this fantastic product, you can put it out in the window on the shelf, customers will swipe their card, pay for it and buy that product there. So you start getting paid for it because that is the highest proof point that we are looking for, right? Theoretically, you might even go to the point of saying, hey, are customers actually using it or not? Now that might be yet another form of it, but at least uh, Alexander has talked about these three things. So, so there are three types of fit and obviously you can see, we start from here, we haven't built anything, right? And some of the talks that we had, Ganga gave a fantastic talk. He basically talked about the whole notion that you, we should try to minimize the amount of software we are writing, right? I mean, in, in, in some of you might be familiar with Google Ventures Design Sprint. So Google Ventures actually has taken the design thinking process into what they call as a five-day design sprint. And they teach people how to prototype literally on a dime, that kind of a thing there. And uh, some of the tools that they do for prototyping, so for example, if I have to build some app kind of a thing. Today, if any of you have to build an app to demonstrate some feature or some workflow, what is the amount of time you, are, you, you guys are going to need to build that working software or a prototype with any level of technical bugs or maturity in that? Give me a number. Couple of months, one month. So at Google Ventures, they actually teach entrepreneurs how to do that in 20 minutes. No, working software, responsive design, I'll, you can click on that on your smartphone or whichever form factor you take, you can click on that, it will show you the next, it's not a pixel perfect, but it will have a solid design basically and it will allow you to navigate and show functionality. It will have mockups, it will have fake doors, but it will still allow you better than a word document or a paper prototype. It's actually, if you think of it, it's faster than making a paper prototype. And it's not a magic. I mean, the tool that they use is basically, uh, they, they talk about Keynotopia. And Keynotopia is a software available with Keynote. And basically what they say is, and again, the key thing about Keynotopia is, you don't write a single line of code. So you build a working software, a working prototype in 20 minutes flat with a software which you don't have to do any coding in that. So that's the whole idea, that's the fun. Because your, your aim should not be to give maximum output. Your aim should be to get maximum outcomes. The learnings, that is the outcome that we are interested in. With the minimum amount of effort, time and money invested in that. That is something that you need here. So have as much of maximum outcome and minimum investment done on that. And only then when you have some level of validation, you go to the market and start looking for a product market fit. And then in that case, go to the bank because that's where you have to put a lot of money to build a really nice shiny application there, right? And uh, so, so in this book, they basically talk about how do you use these tools because, uh, and this is a famous squiggy uh, thing there. The whole idea is, this is how the innovation and creativity process is. It is very messy. It is not waterfall, it is not linear, it is not sequential, it's unpredictable, uh, it is circular. And we come out of it basically over a period of time by doing bunch of experimentations, trials, failures, and then we get into the whole execution part of it. And these are the set of tools that allow you to basically manage your journey through this messy period because you don't know so many moving parts, which one has a cause and effect relationship, how are you going to track it. But using tools like this can actually allow you to design experiments so that you can come out of it much faster with more solid uh, validation of uh, some of your uh, hypothesis. This is one nice way where you can actually use some of this to basically do some ad libs. Uh, some of you might be, uh, maybe from, I don't think anybody is from a marketing or advertising, but this, this tool is a great way. So you might say, our products and services help customers who uh, want to get the jobs done by removing the pains and gains, unlike a normal uh, uh, thing where there is nothing that we are aware of it, right? So it's a good way to actually understand, and if you are able to articulate that, then you might be in a position to basically explain to yourself, not even to other people, why are we even doing something? A lot of times we do something and we don't understand why are we doing this requirement? Is it, 
Is it something that's really helping customers in some shape or form? Is it alleviating some pain that they have lived with all through and through? So this is one way of basically looking at that. So how do we wrap it up? If we look at the whole thing there, this is where we come from the business model canvas to the value proposition design. To create the value for your business, you need to create value for your customers. And to sustainably create value for your customer, you need to create value for your business. So it's kind of a cyclic process that feeds off each other. And this is how it happens there. So I talked about business model canvas. We start from there. On the day one, like as you said, it's a clean slate on day one. We don't know enough of things, so we make hypotheses. We start validating those hypotheses. But one of the challenge with the original business model canvas conversation was, hey, how do we really design the value proposition as accurately, as well uh, it meets the customer things uh, as possible? We know the customer, but then there was no theory or no explanation or no tools given in the original business model canvas book. So then uh, this is the second book came with this uh, the value proposition canvas. Instead of this particular uh, single uh, way of looking at the customer segment, we start looking at customers as jobs to be done, pains and the gains. And then we are able to stratify it even further because we know more about it. Because otherwise it gets totally clubbed into one single monolithic way. But here we have separated out jobs to be done, pains and gains. And then based on that, we start saying, OK, what are the products and services we offer here? What are the gain creators and what are the pain relievers? And then we start really looking at the map of it. One key thing from this point of view is our innovation is not something which is a technology driven innovation. As in, we are not saying that just because I know how to develop this product and service, let me throw it at customers, let me impose it on them. But I am going with the whole humility of saying, I know the technology, but I don't know what exactly you have in mind. I would love to uh, know about it. I would love to be a design thinker. I would love to be uh, to be able to walk in uh, your shoes and really understand what is what is it that you really crave for? What are their pain points? So we are doing actually a very customer-driven innovation, which is we we identify things on the right and then move to the left to basically design the products and services. Exactly. Yeah. So we are looking at all these uh, factors, and then if you really zoom in uh, the, uh, back into this. So this is basically you go at this level and then zoom into this. You get details of that. You come back and you again look at the whole business model canvas here, right? So these are basically the uh, things that I wanted to share here. Um, I'm almost on time, but I think I can take a few questions if we have. Uh, but otherwise, that's that's from me. Thanks a lot for here. Uh, you've been a great audience. Yeah, sure. So how do you address that? Yeah, like I said, there is no hard and fast uh, thing they are looking at. Uh, the one thing that they definitely say is pain is something that you don't have control over. Whereas gain is something that you might get out of it. Uh, very subtle distinction they have given actually. But pain is something that uh, you most likely don't have enough control over. Uh, but like I said, the key thing is, Irrespective of whether we call it as a pain or gain, the idea is that let's not forget one of them. It's possible that I might have skipped something, but explicitly calling pain and gain, I might probably remember it better and uh, be in a better position to, to identify that. Uh, you, yeah, so there could be. Yeah. I would even look at it philosophically at actually between the, the, the thing that we use uh, uh, needs versus wants, right? So uh, I might be hungry, I want food. That is the want, right? Uh, now any food will do, to, to be, uh, biologically any food will do. But then I might say that I want to go to, uh, uh, to a, a, a fine dining and I want to have a, uh, like a $80 meal there or a $200 meal. That's what I need. I need caviar and champagne. I need that. I am actually gold plating my requirements. So I, my, my, if I look at it from a pain point of view, I just need food to fill my belly because that's enough from a biological perspective. But if I take my aspiration and social and emotional needs and I say that I need caviar and champagne, 
I am actually gold plating the requirements and going to the gain because I, if I am really moving in that company, it might actually mean a lot to the group that I hang out with. My personality, my social uh, image might uh, go sh short, shoot through the roof, right? So I, I would even look at it from that point of view. Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah, so actually they talk about pain and uh, something that even after trying to get the job done. So sometimes the very act of helping people creates pain, right? Uh, so this is what uh, is, is so, so they re recognize we should not look at pain as only something that is before the jobs being done. It could be before, during, and after as well. You would have, you would need to have. I mean, like I love Apple products, right? Most of the time they work much better than any other product known to us. But then every time there is an upgrade, it's a shaw, it's a sh what we call as a forklift upgrade. Five GB space should be there on your iPad. It's like you you have to delete a lot of times because you don't have enough space there. So while it solves me a lot of problem, it creates a lot of problem for me in my jobs to be done because I have to delete something, then I get the latest image of iOS, then again I have to reinstall those applications. Right. Yeah. So I think it's the, the whole idea is this will give you a, a, a shared visual language which actually makes it easier for you to kind of track it and share it with the people and say, hey, we know these are the pain points. Now, the same information might be available in your PRDs and specs and BRDs of the world. It might be spread in 30 pages and you have no clue how do you assimilate them together or correlate them whether this particular feature is actually addressing a particular pain point or not. By actually putting it on a canvas and in this kind of a fashion, you probably create higher awareness among your team members. And imagine the power of this was on a, on, on a wall like this. Everybody would know in the team what exactly we are doing, why are we doing, why is this feature. You might even want to put a, a kind of a mapping there that says, hey, this is the pain point that we are really after. It doesn't matter what we are implementing. What we need to understand is this is the pain. How do we alleviate uh, our customers from that pain? Maybe somebody comes up with a smarter solution for that, right? So, okay, I think I'll, uh, uh, I know Smita is here for the next talk here. My time is up. Uh, if there are any more questions, uh, we can meet in the hallway. Otherwise, thanks a lot.